Great. Thank you, Rob. It's nice to see some familiar faces and a few that I don't know. So welcome to everyone. I'm delighted that you want to uh, explore this wonderful text together. I hope it'll be fun. So in this class, as you read in the description, we'll be exploring Gil Fronstall's translation of the Dhammapada. And you know, it looks like this is the hardback version. There's also a paperback version. Um, there are literally dozens of translations of the Dhammapada, and I have a bunch of them myself. Uh, but we, we won't be focusing in this class on comparing different translations, um, which is a very valuable thing to do. But if our aim is to get through um, the entire Dhammapada in three sessions, we're not going to really have time. So I hope that you'll be content with Gil Fronstall's translation. Feel free to read other ones on your own and see how they compare. I sent a handout with some readings and also um, a broad idea of the theme that we'll be covering in each of the three sessions. And so the way that we're dividing up the text is going to illuminate some of the main themes. Obviously, with um, the time we have, we're not going to read every single verse together. But um, the th organizing it by themes gives you some additional information about it than you would have gotten perhaps just reading it on your own. So today we're looking at the introduction and also chapters 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, 12, 15, and 25 and 26, the last two of which we'll see again later. And we'll learn, also learn a little bit about the Dhammapada as a Buddhist text. Um, I'll do some talking and you'll have some chances also to discuss in small groups. We'll have Q&A and so forth and things will unfold from there. So, and we're going to finish at uh, noon Pacific time. So that makes it a 90 minute session, just so that you know. Um, so the Dhammapada, this, this wonderful text, this text is part of, you know, where is it in the Pali Canon? It's part of the Kudika Nikaya, which is the fifth of the Nikayas, there are five. And it's in the, the this last one, the Kudika Nikaya means literally the minor discourses, but the texts in there are not minor uh, at all in terms of importance or profundity. So um, the term Dhammapada itself is a little bit hard to translate, as Gil mentions in his introduction, or maybe it's in the preface, actually. He says um, that we could translate it maybe as sayings of the Dhamma or verses of the Dhamma or teachings of the Dhamma. He even likes path of Dhamma because the word pada which means foot, could also mean path by extension. So um, there's a, so we can, maybe we'll just leave it untranslated as the Dhammapada. And there are several extant versions of this text, including three of them in Pali, as well as some in other Buddhist traditions. Um, and this doesn't, you know, they're slightly different, but it doesn't really, that doesn't cast doubt on its veracity or, you know, um, yeah, utility. Instead, it's, it's actually quite normal that we have multiple versions of a given Buddhist text. If you haven't um, looked much at the, you know, the, the study of texts in a Buddhist, Buddhist studies kind of sense, you may not be aware of that, but there are usually multiple versions of things. And uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, who has researched many of the different versions of the Dhammapada that we have, uh, he says that most of the differences are pretty mild. Um, so the Dhammapada is often seen as a kind of an introduction to Buddhist ideas because it has a lot of the basic concepts spread throughout it, um, but it's definitely not totally for beginners. It includes pretty deep teachings, and it also assumes some understanding of the structure of, of Buddhist teachings. You know, because it's a verse text, it doesn't have prose that explains things. And so um, there is some assumption that you'll know uh, what it means when it says aggregates or arahant or, you know, um, some of the other terminology. 
So if there's any term that you don't understand, um, you can ask during class and we'll clear that up, but it does refer to uh, typical Buddhist concepts. It also includes in some of the verses, some quite clever wordplay, you know, puns basically that are hard to translate into English and also some fairly nuanced language. So all of that adds up to me that it's um, it goes a little bit beyond the kind of straightforwardness that you'd expect from a truly beginner's text, um, something that serves as an introduction. So I think the Dhammapada is really for everyone, and we'll you know we'll see as we go along. So the text consists of 423 verses in 26 chapters, centered on various themes. But within each chapter, you'll see, maybe you've already seen if you did the, the reading for today, that the verses are a little bit mixed. You know, sometimes they refer to practice early on the path, right next to a verse that's about awakening or advanced practice. And they don't necessarily proceed linearly throughout a, a chapter on a given topic. But, you know, that kind of a kind of a systematic exposition of a topic is probably not something that we would expect from a, a, a verse text like this one. So it's not really the point of it either, of a text like the Dhammapada. So I would encourage you to set aside any ideas that what we're gonna see is a nice linear exposition of each of the chapter titles, each of those topics. And then finally, I want to highlight that the Dhammapada is one of the most beloved texts of the Pali Canon. You know, long you, people who haven't even delved into the Majjhima Nikaya or the Samyutta Nikaya may have read the Dhammapada. It's um, well known, it's loved, it's often studied by Buddhists worldwide. And for sure, it has inspired countless practitioners on their path. And now is our chance. Now's our chance to, to partake of that. So I want to spend a little bit of time here at the beginning talking through some of the main themes that Gil highlights in his introduction, if you read that. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll give some examples of these themes from each of the chapters that we read for today. Of course, there are examples spread throughout all the other chapters also, but I'm just um, wanting to keep us within the range today that we were, that, that we were reading. So the first theme I want to highlight is that contrasts are important in the Dhammapada. Um, so the contrasts of what is useful and what is not, uh, the fool and the sage. I mean, we read two chapters about that today. Um, what Gil calls, uh, what, what the text calls uh, punya and papa, which is translated as merit and evil. He says something in the introduction about his choice of that, that word for translation. And then there are various paired chapters that contrast. So, um, you know, what about these contrasts? Why are they being set up? Um, partly as a guide on our practice path so that we know which way to go. Is it toward or away from suffering? And also it highlights the, um, the role of wisdom as discernment. Wisdom is the quality in our mind that discerns what is useful and what is not, what is skillful and what is not, what is going towards suffering and what is going away from suffering. That function is performed by wisdom. So, so this is really a text that highlights also how we can cultivate wisdom in some very specific ways. So as an example, I'm going to, I'll tell you which verses I'm reading in case you want to quickly flip to them, but you don't have to if that's distracting because uh, I'm going to read them. So we can look, for example, at verses three and four in chapter one. He abused me, attacked me, defeated me, robbed me. For those carrying on like this, hatred does not end. She abused me, attacked me, defeated me, robbed me. For those not carrying on like this, hatred ends. So we have a direct teaching on the results of action, in this case, verbal and mental action, essentially. But notice, notice the subtlety of the teaching. It's not um, exonerating anyone of what they did or condoning any actions. Maybe they did uh, attack us. Maybe that happened. If, if that's the case, 
it's in the past, it's already happened, that's not gonna change. Where's the choice? The choice is whether or not we carry on about it. That's a choice that we have in the present. And there's a result of that. If we choose to carry on, hatred will not end. If we choose not to carry on, hatred will end. So it's fairly straightforward. Uh, we can look at the result and decide, is that a result I want? Here's the choice to make. So you'll see um, many things like this. It might sound a little simplistic at first, and, and it's true that things are not always so straightforward. Don't worry, there are other um, chapters that are, you know, that have more nuance in them. Okay, so then we also have the contrast of foolish and wise. So I'm looking now at verses 64 and 65, which are in chapter five, the fool. A fool associating with a sage, even for a lifetime, will no more perceive the dharma than a spoon will perceive the taste of soup. A discerning person who associates with a sage, even if for a brief moment, will quickly perceive the dharma as the tongue perceives the taste of soup. So we get this lovely image of soup on a spoon or soup on a tongue. You can feel the difference, right, just in those words about perceiving the dharma. So again, there's this pointing toward wisdom, a discerning person, that means a wise person. Uh, Gill points out that we shouldn't see these insulting lines about fools as denigrating particular people. It's rather that our mind is foolish when we aren't mindful or when we aren't wise, you know, which we all are like that part of each day, right? So it's more about skillful or unskillful behavior. Any of us could be a fool at a certain time. And we also have certain fool, foolish, that is childish aspects of our mind. And through practice, we become, we become more wise. Okay, so then there's the contrast of merit and evil, punya and papa. We could also just say merit and demerit <clears throat> or merit and bad, <laughs> badness. <clears throat> that might be a better translation. So we could look at verses 15 and 16 in chapter one. One who does evil grieves in this life, grieves in the next, grieves in both worlds. Seeing one's own defiled acts brings grief and affliction. One who makes merit rejoices in this life, rejoices in the next, rejoices in both worlds. Seeing one's own pure acts brings joy and delight. So here we see a reference to rebirth, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, so again, we have a contrast of, you know, if you don't behave well, then there's suffering, not only immediately, but also in the next life. And we, and it comes from seeing uh, these acts that we've done. Whereas if we have done good acts, then we can rejoice about that, not only here, but in lives to come. And it's seeing our own pure acts that can bring about joy and delight. So I, I admit that sometimes these merit, demerit verses can be a little bit simplistic. They might sound a little bit absolute or moralistic in certain ways. Um, part of this is getting used to the language of the Dhammapada. Uh, I encourage you not to be put off by the very clear distinctions that the Dhammapada makes in some cases. If you look at, as I said before, if you look at the Dhammapada as a whole, it's an interesting mix of clear distinctions and some subtlety. We'll get to, we'll get to some subtlety even later today. Um, so I think actually that the Dhammapada as a whole nicely balances being um, simplistic and rigid and being uh, overly vague about what works and doesn't. It actually, I think, moves in a, a good clear middle path between those. Uh, Buddhist teachings are clear about what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. That is not actually unclear in Buddhist teachings, but liberation is of a whole different order. Um, so we have to know the clear distinctions in order to walk the path. But in the end, the mind is going to move beyond um, just distinguishing this from that, this from that. So it's... Um, it's a little bit a matter of you know which part of the path are we speaking to and which aspect of cultivation are we speaking to. 
So that then points us toward the two different goals that are expressed in the Dhammapada. So one goal is happiness and a better rebirth. We saw that previously in the verses I just read about, you know, one who does evil grieves in this life, grieves in the next, grieves in both worlds. So we have, um, and then one who does merit uh, rejoices and has a good rebirth, right? So that's, that's seen as a valid goal in Buddhism. And a lot of Buddhists worldwide today are practicing actually for a better rebirth. Uh, that's you know that's their actual aim, and so um, the Buddha taught that because he wanted you know he wanted people to do good, to do merit, to um, be skillful and learn ethics very deeply, and be able to enact that in their lives. And it's nice to know it on one hand, but can we actually do it? And you know he that's as we know those of us who were practicing that. We know that is no small feat in and of itself, right? Is to enact right speech, right action, um, kindness. So that is a um, that is uh, extolled actually in the Dhammapada as an excellent way to live. But there is another goal, also uh, the goal of liberation, of escaping. You know, not just getting a better rebirth, but escaping the cycle of rebirth completely. As a friend of mine said recently, exiting the premises. <laughs> so that can also be a, a valid goal. And if I, there's lots and lots of examples of this, but if um, I wanted to pick one from our readings for this week, we see it in chapter seven, the Arahant. So verse 97, the person who has gone beyond faith, knows the unmade, has severed the link, destroyed the potential for rebirth, and eliminated clinging is the ultimate person. So this verse is clearly extolling the wish to become an arahant, who is someone who has uh, become liberated, fully awakened, will not be reborn. So my understanding of this is that it means that everybody who's reading the Dhammapada can find a path. Everybody can find something that's inspiring for them and find a way to practice from reading these verses. Um, then we come to two issues for modern readers to consider. Um, one of them is that uh, the, the Dhammapada does have a clear emphasis on renunciation, on solitude, on monasticism. There is no doubt that that is held up as an ideal way of living and you know, we might consider, do we just ignore every verse that seems to be about that because we're lay people and that's not what we're doing? Maybe there's a way we could take them to heart in some way. And then maybe going hand in hand with that is an apparent denial of the world. So you know, there are uh, definitely verses that point toward you know, the pointlessness of pursuing any form of pleasure things like that. Um, and so again, we can consider, well, instead of denying the world, what we're denying or what we're letting go of is attachment, attachment to the world. It's not the world itself. I mean, here we are, but we don't want to be attached. That will lead to dukkha. So maybe as a verse I picked out from our readings is uh, verses 87 and 88 in chapter six, the sage giving up dark ways Sages cultivate the bright. They go from home to homelessness, to the solitude so hard to enjoy. There, they should seek delight, abandoning sensual pleasures, having nothing. Sages should cleanse themselves of what defiles the mind. So you might read that and kind of not really feel turned on by that image. I mean, maybe you do, but um, some people read it and say, hmm. But we might consider just taking the possibility of the, the flavor of these verses as an inspiration for lay life. You know, we know uh, most people who've practiced for a while are aware that just pursuing sense pleasures and comfort isn't very meaningful. It doesn't really deeply satisfy us. And so, you know, how can we live a, a lay life, whatever life we've chosen, in a way that is in line with this Buddhist teaching that 
grasping at desires and pleasure all the time just isn't going to do it for us. You know, what does that mean for us as lay people? And if we're, you know, if we live with a lot of other people in our family and we think, well, solitude isn't really how I live, could it be that we can find a way to be, a phrase that Gil sometimes uses actually, is to be alone with others? You know, can we have mindfulness and clarity and, you know, um, some degree of independence while we're with other people? Ironically, a mind that is mindful and clear is able to be more connected to other people than one that's kind of falling into attachment in the relationship. Okay, so uh, maybe then, then the last area I want to talk about is the um, contrasting flavors um, that uh, is mentioned in the introduction. This is referring to uh, something, I won't go into great detail on this, but in, remember this is an ancient Indian text and it came out of ancient Indian culture. And at that time, and I think maybe even now, there's a, co a concept in Indian aesthetics of, you know, meaning the arts of various kinds, uh, drama, plays, stories, um, that is called savor. Rasa is the Sanskrit word. And there's an idea that there's a, a given set of savors, their emotion, emotional tones, essentially, that the piece is meant to evoke in us, is meant to touch in us or speak to in some way. You know, they're kind of emotions of the human conditions, like we would see them in the Greek plays also, for example. And um, the idea is that you would have one main one and then a contrasting one that plays off of it to show the complexity of being human. And so that's my super top level summary of that. I'm someone who's a scholar in it, I hope wouldn't wince too much, but would have much more to say. Um, but the contrasting flavors that we see in the Dhammapada, a work of literature from that time, one of them is energy, virya, also called the heroic flavor. Um, and then the other is peace, santi. Uh, you may have heard the word, the Sanskrit version of that word, shanti, meaning peace. So Pali would be santi. So we have virya and santi. Um, energy is characterized or exemplified in chapter two, which we read, and the peace is exemplified in chapters 15 and 25, which we also read for this week. So let's look a bit at some verses from chapter, from, from the, actually from various of the chapters, but I'll start with chapter two. It opens with a famous verse that some of you may have heard quoted. Verse 21, vigilance is the path to the deathless, negligence the path to death. The vigilant do not die, the negligent are as if already dead. So here's one more contrast, right? Vigilance and negligence, one more thing set up for wisdom to discern. And there's some stark language there that is you know, partially metaphorical. Um, you know, we can see the relative deadness of being unmindful. You know, if somebody is very distracted, if you're, when your mind is distracted, not connected to the present moment, not really paying that much attention, we all go through mo moments like that every day. Isn't there a kind of deadness to the mind compared to moments when you're feeling bright, mindful? aware, connected, present. There's, a, there's an aliveness there. So that I think is what's being pointed to here. Um, we might also look at verse 25, also in chapter two. Through effort, vigilance, restraint, and self-control, the wise person can become an island. No flood will overwhelm. So you really see the point, the clear pointing here to you know, energy, heroism, um, vigilance, restraint, effort. And, you know, we don't emphasize this as Dharma teachers in the West too much because you may have noticed that some of us are a little bit predisposed toward over striving. Um, but we can't, if we read Buddhist teachings, we really can't ignore that this is a theme, um, particularly in the Dhammapada, but really across all the texts, is that the Buddha encouraged really clear effort to be present, to be mindful, to um, investigate experience, and so forth. Um, 
I would say that we also see some encouragement uh, toward effort in chapter 12, uh, which is called oneself, uh, in, in the sense where we're asked to really take responsibility for our actions and hence our own happiness. So I wanna read a couple from there too. So verse 157 from chapter 12, if one knew oneself to be precious, one would guard oneself with care. The sage will watch over herself in any part of the night. So we have this sense of uh, vigilance and guarding ourselves. It means guarding the sense doors with care. Because we care about ourselves. we are mindful in order that um, our mind doesn't get overtaken. Like the previous verse said, it will, our mind can become an island that no flood can overwhelm. And why do we do that? Because we know ourselves to be precious. We care about our own heart, our own state of mind. And so we make effort um, to keep the mind in a wholesome state. We also see in verse 160, one indeed is one's own protector. What other protector could there be? With self-control, one gains a protector hard to obtain. So again, this sense uh, that we would be vigilant and careful with our practice uh, as a protection for ourselves. It also is a protection for others, as we know. But of course, in the chapter on oneself, it's emphasizing toward ourself. Okay, so that, let me turn then to the second of the savers, um, the savor of peace, Santi. You can see that's kind of a contrast to effort and energy and trying hard, striving. Uh, and then we get to the peace. So this, uh, it's a contrast and maybe one leads to the other. Uh, I think I can't talk about peace though, unless I make the point right from the start that in Buddhist teachings, peace and happiness are strongly linked. They're clearly related. And almost every chapter that talks a lot about peace also talks a lot about happiness and joy. So for example, we can look in chapter 15, at verse 198. Ah, so happily we live without misery among those in misery. Among people in misery, we live without misery. So there's a sense of this happiness that just comes from within, this ability to be at peace in a world that is not, not at peace, not happy, maybe miserable. There are some similar verses that talk about anger and I think um, ambition that are of a similar flavor. And then we also have verse 201. Victory gives birth to hate. The defeated sleep in anguish, giving up both victory and defeat. Those who have attained peace sleep happily. So here we have a contrast again between victory and defeat, but it's not a simplistic contrast, right? Where this is the good one, this is the bad one. It says giving up both victory and defeat. So here we get our first flavor of some of the nuance that we have in the Dhammapada. If you try to read that literally, you might say, what does that even mean to give up both victory and defeat? You stop playing the game. And that is what the state of peace is about, is stopping to play those games. So we see that there's um, a movement from, from looking at contrast, which one is better, this one is good, this one is bad, to the possibility of releasing that kind of mindset. And that's what maybe what the piece is about. And it's linked, of course, to happiness. So awakening helps us step out of these distinctions in some ways. And then I want to mention also some from chapter 25, because remember 15 and 25 are the ones that kind of most exemplify Santi. Uh, verse 373, chapter 25, the bhikkhu. That means monk, by the way, but it could also just mean a serious practitioner. So we were being spoken to there also. For a bhikkhu with a peaceful mind who enters an empty dwelling and clearly sees the true dharma, there is superhuman joy. Wow. So uh, this is for 
a practitioner who reaches any of the stages of awakening, but it could be speaking to us. And then verse 381, a bhikkhu filled with delight and pleased with the Buddha's teachings attains happiness, the stilling of formations, the state of peace. So it's interesting that he says attains happiness, but then the stilling of formations and the state of peace, those are descriptions of Nibbana, of freedom, of complete awakening. So that's the highest happiness. So again, we have peace and happiness relatively inseparable. Um, yeah. So I think I will um, pause there as this is kind of going over We've gone over all the ideas that Gill introduces in the introduction and linked them to verses that were in our readings for today. And at this point, I wonder if you have questions either about what we've talked about, the, you know, the main ideas that Gill highlights as being important in the Dhammapada or uh, other verses from our reading that um, you might have questions about. I have a little bit more to say later, but... Um, I'll stop here for, for now. Oh, and if you, um, if you wanted to ask a question, it would be great if you could, like Steve, uh, raise your Zoom hand because that puts you to the um, top of the list where, you know, the top of the boxes so I can see you. And please keep your hand up while you're talking in order that um, you don't disappear. So, um, the, and then the other thing I want to ask, it feels right in the moment, is I'm spotlighted right now, and that means that the recording is capturing my video as well as my voice. Um, if you are not, if you are choose to be spotlighted, everybody else will be able to see you, and I'll be able to see you better, but you'll also be recorded on the video. So you have a choice um, if when I call on you, if you want to be spotlighted or if, or if you don't. So Steve, you're first. Would you like to be spotlighted or not? No need. No need. Okay, but please keep your hand up so I can see you. Go okay. ahead. So when uh, when I read the chapter on self, um, it occurred to me that Gill did not discuss that in the introduction, since there is so much uh, in in the teachings of not self. Here's a chapter on self. So I wonder if you might address that. Great question. Uh, I sometimes, I once taught a class on um, surprises in the suttas, you know, like suttas that I think are surprising. And I chose chapter 12 of the Dhammapada you know, entitled One Self as one of them. So yes, there's a whole teaching on self, a, a skillful um, self. And if you read the, you know, as you read in the chapter, um, a lot of the teachings in chapter 12 are about how we can guard ourselves or protect ourselves, and how the way that we're acting is either harming ourselves or benefiting ourselves. So these are teachings that are in the, um, you know, the realm of skillful behavior, skillful action, and how to uh, use our sense of ourself as a being who matters in the world. Uh, as a means of walking the path, you know, caring about ourselves and cleaning up our mind and our heart. It's not like it's somebody else's mind and heart. It's definitely yours. So it's our five aggregates, if you will. So um, there is ultimately, you know, in the end, there isn't any given thing that we could name as ourself, as the Atta. The Buddha was clear about that. But he didn't shy away from the idea that we are, you know, a being who's responsible for our development on the path. Does that help? Okay, great, thank you. Um, Kurt. Hi, Kim. Uh, what's the difference between peace and happiness? Um, well, they're different qualities. I mean, do you feel that there's a difference in your mind between peace and happiness? I'm confused about it. Ah, well, they are strongly linked, as I said, uh, and in the teachings for sure. And I think, um, you know, it's something that we can experience for ourselves is that happiness um, could, happiness has a wide range, let's say it that way, right? There's the happiness of a birthday party, 
and the kind of joy and excitement that goes with that. And then there's also the happiness that we can feel in when meditation becomes deep on the cushion and the, the body is just filled with this very tranquil sense of ease. And that's another form of happiness, right? And so the Buddha, I think, in linking happiness and peace is kind of pointing us down the track on happiness to, to look for the refinement of it. How could my happiness be more peaceful, even more peaceful than it is? Some versions are happier than, are peace, more peaceful than others. Does that start to answer your question or yes, do you have, is you. there more? Yeah, I think we can sense into it experientially, but they're both very good. We, we want both happiness and peace to come from practice. Um, Paul. Hi there, sorry about that. Um, so um, nice to meet everybody. This is uh, the first class I've been to in a while. Um, thank you very much, Kim, I appreciate it. A uh, couple of quick questions. Um, first of all, um, I did not receive the handouts. I didn't see them in the email that was sent to me. Can you clarify where the handouts are? Oh, okay. Yeah, they were sent. They were an attachment along with the email that had the um, the Zoom link in it. And uh, if you reach out to the Sati Center email, like maybe they were just sent in a format that somehow you couldn't receive. Uh, Rob can make sure you get it for next time. Okay. Um, and um, the other uh, two questions are, um, is the Dhammapada considered the centerpiece and key learnings of Buddhism similar to Tao Te Ching and Taoism? Um, I... I wouldn't say so. It's part of it's part of the broad spectrum of the teachings in the Nikayas in the suttas, um, and it's one that's as I said beloved, and it's a kind of a overview text that's short and approachable. So a lot of people have read it, um, but I wouldn't say it defines the Buddha's teachings in the way that the Tao Te Ching does. But, what, what is there? A, is there a Buddhist book that does is similar to the Tao Te Ching as the Tao? That's a good question. I bet everybody who studies the suttas has their favorite set. Um, but you know, we would have to. Um, if the only one that I could, the only sutta that I could name within this Western insight tradition is the Satipatthana Sutta, as one. That's the sutta on the establishments of mindfulness that has the instructions that we use at most of our major retreats. So, you know, that that's the instructions on how to establish mindfulness, which is the key practice that we do. But as far as exemplifying the Buddhist teachings, no, even the Satipatthana Sutta doesn't do that. Okay. So, yep. And then the last quick question is, wouldn't doesn't the pursuit of happiness sort of seem like a, a cloud or a formation and sort of inconsistent with this idea of trying to eliminate those types of pursuits? Yeah, you're pointing to some subtlety in that it's true that the Buddha says um, at some point that the part of the path is to eliminate quests. <laughs> and um, so there is that aspect. But the Buddha was very skilled as a teacher, and he knew that uh, deep in the human heart, we all want to be happy. You know, that's something that we all share. And so the problem is that we don't know what happiness is or how to get it. That's the problem, the, the ignorance or the delusion around what it really means, how do I get it? You know, is happiness uh, getting the right partner, getting a good job and living in a suitable place? Is that enough? Most of us, if, if you actually achieve those things, which by the way, is not that easy, we find it's not enough. And so these teachings uh, use a little carrot. It says there's a better happiness, there's a better happiness, uh, all the way until eventually, yes, we do have to let go of wanting to be happy because it's a want, but it's a good want if we pursue it through the methods of the path. So we don't start at the end. Does that help? It does, uh, and it sort of it does. Your final comments on that do do seem to see that say that um, sort of dropping that pursuit ultimately su supersedes the actual pursuit itself. 
in the end, the happiness of letting go is greater than any happiness we can attain. Let's say it that way. Got it. Thanks. Um, Sharon. Thank you, Kim. Um, my questions are about 26, the Brahman. I was really blown away by um, the extensive um, phrases and um, pages and pages <laughs> devoted to the Brahman. Um, I never considered um, that role significant before. I um, pretty much put the Brahman in the role of the hereditary priestly class and didn't consider that they also have a spiritual path. And um, so that was that was quite a shock. Um, oh, to I'm going to say a little bit more about chapter 26 later. Um, the Buddha is using the term Brahman differently than the hereditary religious class. Well, my question specifically, uh, um, verse 420, do you want to take that later? In that um, verse, he refers to our, um an arhat and a brahman and um so i i was a little confused Are, yeah you think he... out exactly the verse where he finally makes it clear um so in in all of chapter 26 the brahman refers to the arhat and i'll talk about that oh. more later in the class okay thank you yeah, but I'm delighted that you picked that up. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Carol Ann. Hello, thank you for offering this class. Um, I'm wondering if you can offer some, uh, your thoughts or some insight regarding chapter five, verse 62. Okay, verse and I'll let 62. you find that. And then... Yeah, okay. Oh, a fool um, suffers, yes. Yeah, a fool suffers thinking, I have children, I have wealth. One's self is not even one's own. How then are children? How then is wealth? And I'm just, it seems like a smattering of, I, I, don't, I don't know how to make sense of it, I guess. Yeah. Um, so this is a teaching, this is contrasting with chapter 12 about the self, right? So this is a not self teaching. And he's pointing quite directly to, um, uh, this is maybe in that realm where Gil says it sounds like a denial of the world. You know, it sounds like, you know, it's saying that you shouldn't enjoy your children or your wealth or something like that. Those are not a valid form of happiness. Those are a valid form of happiness in a sense, but we have to admit that if we're attached to our children or our wealth, there is dukkha there, isn't there? Yeah, there's yes, attachment. definitely. Yeah. yeah, and you know, anybody who has children knows the the challenges of um, you know uh, when there is attachment, strong attachment there. So he's pointing. Uh, it's a strong teaching, but. He's pointing um, toward not uh, possessing even the things that we find most dear to our heart, not gra even grasping those, you know, things that we're sure uh, are ours in a sense. They certainly make the, the whole flavor of our life. Even grasping to those uh, will lead to suffering. And so someone who doesn't realize that, whose life is just about getting wealth and all wrapped up in the lives of their children, there's a lot of suffering there. And he's saying that um, there's a, another way through understanding uh, non-possession. Okay. Yeah, these verses are quite succinct. Uh, there's a, there's a, a whole sutta that unfolds the ideas here. Uh, it's Sutta Nipata 1.2, the Dhaniya Sutta. 
um, different text. But uh, it's partly on my mind because we're going to teach about it in January. Um, but there's a whole sutta where um, there's a wealthy uh, cowherd, essentially, who is debating with the Buddha about what, what true wealth and security are about. And uh, this, you'll see, if you read that sutta, this verse pretty much is a compact version of the sutta. I'll put in the chat um, what that reference is for those who can look it up. Sutta Nipata, it's N, two. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, we'll have Alex and then Eileen. And that'll be it for now. All right. Hi, Kim. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk. I think this is a lot of fun. Um, my question um, has to do with uh, the idea you mentioned, or from the Dhammapada, of the mind becoming an island that no flood can overcome. And when um, hearing you, you talk about that made, uh, made me uh, think back to something Gil um, lectured on in one of his uh, morning sittings um, about having a mind like an open house, and which is which sounds like a, a bit of a contrast. But I, I think I, I have some idea of what that they that they don't really conflict. Those two ideas don't really conflict with each other with each other. But I was hoping to hear you talk about that to some degree. Do you mean his? Um use of uh, the mind as an open house as an analogy for mindfulness? Yeah, and I think uh, I think uh, the distinction is um, that um, in my, the way I understand it, and please correct me if, I, if I'm looking at it in the wrong way, but um, that so, you know, you can have a mind like an open house, but be guarded in the sense of keeping an eye out both externally and internally for the three poisons, as they're called, you know. And yeah. like and like being mindful of that when they arise, and if you can do so both internally and externally, then you're you're okay. Right. What what we want is a mind that can't be overwhelmed, right? Yeah. So when things happen, you know, maybe something very beautiful or something very terrible comes into our visual field, we don't get overwhelmed by that and reactive to it in some way. So I think it's actually pointing to the same idea, is the um, the, the image of a flood uh, is a specific image in Buddhism of the flood of sensuality, the flood of becoming, and the flood of ignorance. Um, there's actually a, a list of the floods, but we could say greed, hatred, and delusion. Those are the poisons, but it, it's a, a similar list, yeah. you know, list of problems of the mind. And we want a mind that's strong through what? Vigilance and mindfulness a mind that's strong enough that it can't be knocked over easily by these things. Good All right, question. thank you. Yep. Okay, Eileen, and then, then we'll move on. And thank you for the offering. Um, I'm really glad that you did uh, verse 201. Okay. Um, Eileen, I can't hear you very well. I heard verse 201. Can you get any closer? Yeah, can you hear me better now? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. All right. So verse 201, you know, with the elections coming up, my thinking is it would be a really good idea to master giving up both victory and defeat. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, you know, I'm kind of thinking about that in my head. Am I giving up the expectation of an outcome? Am I giving up um, being invested in the outcome? What do I need to let go so I can sleep peacefully on Tuesday night? That's wow, great question. practical question. Yeah, so um, this verse, I think, I think the way you're framing it, we could say it has a couple different levels, and maybe one level is um, true equanimity. So I don't mean equanimity like I don't care. Um, true equanimity allows us to care about things, but accept that conditions are not in our control. So we do our best and then accept how things actually are without any dukkha, you know, because the conditions are as they are. So that's one way to let go of victory and defeat is to just um, be able to acknowledge the reality as something that came about through multiple conditions and 
you know, that was how it, that's how it is. So that so people who are very equanimous can act in the world, but not get stuck on whether or not they succeeded or failed. So that's one level. And then uh, another level would be um, more the ultimate level where the concepts of victory and defeat um, are not relevant to an arahant. There's no, because there's no person who could win or lose. So it doesn't, it's not a meaningful distinction. And that's a different level. So does that make sense in some way, in a practical yes, sense? Yeah, you asked does. about Tuesday really night. Really How does that yeah. land for you for Tuesday night? Well, um, I'm going to do a lot of practicing around equanimity. Yeah, I think the... Because I don't think I'm air hot yet. So. <laughs> no, I just want it to be complete. Yes, yes. For, for Tuesday, we have multiple conditions. We're not in control. We've done our best and the world will, the conditions will unfold naturally as, as naturally as dropping this pen, it's going to fall because of gravity. All right. It'll be as it is. Thank you so much, Kim. Okay, thank you for all the good questions. I wanted to, um, uh, yeah, I'm glad to hear all those. So let's go ahead now with some small group discussion. Um, for those of you who are saying, oh no, I hate small group discussion, it'll be pretty short. <laughs> um, and some of you may be uh, looking forward to it. So we will have groups of three or four. Um, and when you get into your group, I think we'll give, let's see, and you can just have a discussion among yourselves and we'll say uh, 10 minutes in the group. And the question for you to consider, and I'll put it in the chat also, is how do you re relate to the flavors, as they were called, of energy and peace in the text? Do you feel different tones, kind of different emotional tones from the energy and the peace? And how does your heart respond to each one of those? Okay, so I think that is everybody coming back. Thank you. I hope you had a good discussion. And I realize we didn't have the timer on there, but it was actually 10 minutes. So um, I was hoping that some people might have uh, a couple comments to share about how that was for you or any wisdom that may have come up from your group. I see Michael, your hand is raised. Did you have a comment? Yes, thank you, Kim. Uh, in our group, uh, the question of uh, the difference between calm and peace was kind of ambiguous. Can you speak to that? Hmm, calm and peace. Yeah, they're similar. Um, I suppose there's a distinction in the teachings between um, feelings like tranquility, you know, which would be calm or various forms of samadhi or shamatha that are characterized by calm. And then um, peace uh, might be a synonym for that, but there can also be the peace that um, is pointed to in, by you know, Nibbana as peace. And that um, is not characterized by particular qualities that we would point to. So I think, though, in, this, in the terms of the Dhammapada, we could say that uh, calm and peace are very much similar. What came out in your discussion? Anything else besides them being vague? Well, uh, one thing that uh, one of the uh, participants brought up that I thought was spot on was um, uh, relating these um, verses um, or rather um, attaining peace uh, through the seven factors of enlightenment, uh, what's required, mindfulness, and then the word you use energy that leads to tranquility and joy and mm -hmm. eventually concentration and equanimity. So that seems to fit quite well or did in our discussion so yeah i would agree there's the the calm of tranquility and concentration and then there's 
um, Nibbana has a, is, is a, a, a different dimension, let's say, awakening. Great. Um, Steve. In our group, uh, it's very interesting point came up as to whether or not the Buddha was being judgmental and talking about fools and about uh, bad behavior and things like this. And I can, uh, I can see <clears throat> that that kind of uh, perception is easy because of uh, language. Um, and we were talking about whether it was pointing to character or whether it was pointing to behavior and the consequences of behavior. So with, could you uh, just talk about that a little? Yeah, I think Gil mentions it too in the introduction. He says it points to actions, to behavior. It's about skillful and unskillful. Um, and yes, in modern psychology, we worry a lot about judgmentalism because it can be done unskillfully. But um, when you look in terms of the results of action, uh, it's clear that some things lead to suffering and some things lead away from suffering. That's an important distinction to be able to make if you're going to walk the path. So um, there's judiciousness and there's judgmentalism, and it's good to know the difference between them. Uh, Maria, and that'll be the last one for now. Hi. Uh, we weren't, uh, our group wasn't quite sure if there was a specific passage that we were supposed to be looking at, but we had a, a, a nice discussion about the, um, whether peacefulness and, um, and uh, uh, the, the, sorry, the energy, right? Was it, um, could they coexist basically? Mm -hmm. Um, and we ended up talking a little bit about how one can maybe lead to being peaceful, can maybe lead to having more energy or more positive energy to invest in something in the real world, or um, that being peaceful could be um, the reduction of that kind of agitation or negative energy, I guess. So not a specific question, just some highlights from our discussion. I love that. They are meant to be um, things that complement each other in a sense, and they could coexist, and they maybe puri purify each other also. So I think your your group's discussion highlighted all of those different dimensions. It sounds, sounds quite beautiful. Thank you. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, then... Um, Let's, uh, let's actually sit for a few minutes because um, I'm going to do a short guided meditation and drop in some verses so that we can experience uh, these teachings in a somewhat different mode, right? We've read them maybe by ourselves. We heard um, me talk about them and read some of them. You talked about them in a small group. You can also experience these verses through meditative mind. So it'll just be brief, but um, please take a posture where you can sit for a few minutes. Um, be comfortable. No need to change too much. Just find a comfortable place. And if it's okay for you, you could close your eyes. Otherwise, it can just be gently open. And just allowing your attention to come inward, bringing it, pulling it back from the screen, just into your body, finding the body, perhaps bringing the attention to the place where you're sitting, your seat against the chair, perhaps, maybe your feet are against the floor. So what is supporting you? Bringing your attention there. And just gently allowing yourself to feel balanced where you're sitting. If you've been leaning forward to look at the screen, you might need to straighten up a bit. Using fewer muscles to hold yourself up. And then gently connecting to a simple object, 
Often people use the breath. But if that doesn't work for you, you can use sound in the environment, just the natural background sounds around you, just to rest the mind on something simple. And just allowing mindfulness of that object to be the main focus just for a few minutes. Letting thoughts or other things go more into the background. It's supportive for meditation to relax, so softening the shoulders, allowing them to drop naturally, maybe softening the face, jaw. Softening down through the chest area, the belly. And letting go of any bracing in the arms and legs. Anything that's willing to let go. I'm just going to read two verses. You can just let the words drop in the way we would drop a stone into a well, perhaps. Absorbed in meditation, persevering, always steadfast, the wise touch nirvana, the ultimate rest from toil. Tasting the flavor of solitude and peace, one becomes free of distress, drinking the flavor of Dharma joy. Okay, so I'd like to now say just a bit more about the readings for today, and also a bit about how to approach reading suttas in general and verses in particular. So we haven't yet said anything about chapter 26 officially, although we had a perfect question earlier from Sharon about, about it. 
So this is the chapter that's called the Brahman. And it brings together many of the themes that are throughout the Dhammapada. And it's a long chapter, I know. And it kind of, um, it, it brings them together in a particular way through the Buddha's definition of a Brahman. And just to familiarize you with the word, I know some of you know it, but uh, the Brahmins were the hereditary religious class in ancient Indian society. And the Buddha was from a different class called the Katyas. They were more the aristocrats or the warriors and they were the governmental figures. Um, the Brahmins consider themselves the highest spiritually, which makes sense if you're the religious caste. Um, but the Buddha, as he often did in his teachings, he redefined uh, the terms of his time to suit his teaching. And in particular, he redefines the term Brahman to mean Arahant, the highest spiritual person in his teaching. And so we see this in chapter 26, where a number of the stanzas start with whoever, blah, 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 does certain things or has certain qualities. Uh, and then the last line is, I call a Brahman. So for example, verse 391, whoever does no ill through body, speech, and mind, and is restrained in these three areas, I call a Brahman. So he's saying effectively um, that um, it doesn't matter that you're an inherited, hereditary, you know, you're, you're of this class because your parents were, it matters instead what you do and how you are. That's what defines the quality of a person spiritually. Uh, it's not good enough that you have this birth pure for seven generations back. Uh, you know, show me that you're ethical. Show me that you're wise. Um, oh, people asked about the, it's verse 23 and verse 205 is what I read during the meditation. Um, so there's a distinction drawn between um, the uh, Arahants and the, and the Brahmins through these, these kinds of verses. And then I'll also say that in chapter 26, there's a different distinction drawn between the Arahant and various other ascetic practitioners of the time. So the Brahmins weren't the only other spiritual people. There was a whole group of people who opted out of society. Uh, there was a way that you could live in ancient India where you became homeless, you become, became a mendicant. And uh, people would feed you <laughs> effectively if you, you could wander with an alms bowl and meditate out in the woods and so forth. And that was an accepted way of life, kind of. And the Buddha was one of those people. He, you know, he left his family, he left his position in society, but he wasn't the only one doing that. There were other ascetics out there teaching. And so he was also contrasting his teaching with other ascetics. And there were, for example, some of them were doing genuine ascetic practice, like eating only a few grains of rice per day, or wearing tree bark as their clothing, or acting like a dog. There was a dog duty ascetic uh, is the name. Or there was also an ox duty ascetic, people who acted like oxes. And there was a belief, there were beliefs that those were that was a good way to purify the mind, to burn up karma. And the Buddha makes it clear that in his understanding, those practices are not onward leading, just doing asceticism and denial of the body kind of for no other purpose than pure purification is not actually purifying the mind. So purifying the mind is different than that. So we see, for example, in verse 394, fool, what use is matted hair? What use is a deerskin robe? The tangled jungle is within you and you groom the outside. So it's, you know, it's the heart and the mind where we have challenges with attachment, with greed, hatred, and delusion. It's not going to help to um, never comb your hair or live out in the forest and not eat very much. It's a different, you know, it's a different path that the Buddha offers to becoming um, a, good, a, a good and eventually enlightened human being. So we'll read chapter 26 again for the third class, and I think you'll see more in it the second time. 
if you if you read it for today and if you read it again a couple of weeks from now. So that leads to my speaking a little bit uh, in the last few minutes about how to approach these texts. You know, um, so I like to speak pretty directly about having a relationship with spiritual texts. And so it, it includes some of the qualities of relationship, of getting to know them, of trusting and uh, giving yourself to them in a certain way in order that you can receive uh, more deeply from them to gain some intimacy, essentially. So um, here are some possibilities that you can try in your relationship with texts. Uh, one is to read somewhat slowly. So, you know, reading, if, if it's something that you do throughout your day for your job, often we're just reading quickly for ideas or content. Let me scan through this email. You know, let me quickly read this article in preparation for the meeting. Um, but we, we don't want to do that with a spiritual text. So you can deliberately read it slowly. Uh, you can also read just before meditating. So it's hard to read during meditation like I did because you have to break the meditation. But if you read just beforehand, there's a way that the ideas can kind of inform the sit or infuse the heart in a certain way. Uh, you can also read through, and may maybe you had this experience if you did the reading before this class, is that certain verses kind of catch in your mind and you say, oh, that's an interesting one. Well, if that happens, great. Um, uh, carry that verse around with you for the day. Maybe you read in the morning and the one that catches your eye, just jot it down and read it a few times throughout your day and see how it might interact with your mind during the day. Or you could consider a theme for the day. You know, today is about vigilance. <laughs> you know, let's see. Um, so you read that chapter and then you see how vigilance shows up or doesn't. <laughs> Maybe it's a day of negligence. And so you see the contrast. Um, but just carrying a theme or an idea and letting it kind of resonate with your daily life activities and see how it comes through. And then another thing I, I do sometimes is I reread a certain chapter several times with a gap in between. So, you know, I'll read it one morning and then I'll read it two days from now and then I'll read it over the weekend, you know, and, and each time we'll see how it strikes us differently. And you'll see that, it, wait a minute, I, I read this, this is the third time I'm reading this chapter, and I don't think I even saw this stanza until today. You know, it's like um, different things stand out at different times. So I encourage you to um, explore, play around with these verses. They're short and sweet. So it's, um, you can do this with prose suttas also, these, all these various techniques, but the verses are particularly nice and approachable for that. Um, good. So, so let me say a little bit about uh, uh, what to do for next week. So you'll have another set of verses, of chapters to read. I think the whole thing was in that handout, but in case you didn't get it, make sure you do. And there's a, so there's another set of chapters to read for next week. And I also would like, if you remember, to come prepared with two verses one verse that you found particularly inspiring. And then second, a verse that you found puzzling in a dharmic way. So something that it catches your interest and you wonder about how it plays out in practice or you wonder what it means dharmically, something like that. So one that you find inspiring and one that you find dharmically puzzling. And maybe try out some of these ways to interact with the texts. Um, so we have a couple minutes. If there is any last questions or something that would help you feel complete. Okay, there's Chris. Hi. Oh, I need something to make me feel complete this morning. I figure that out. Maybe I'll figure it out this afternoon. This was an offer out. There's a whole bunch of uh, reciting of the Dhammapada on YouTube from various teachers if people want to just listen to it. I've been actually enjoying listening to it. And then also, I spent a lot of time on Wikipedia this morning looking up Brahmin, and there's a quite a long historical discussion of what time, what the Brahmins were doing, depending on what era in India. So I just want to offer that out if people want to read that. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for pointing toward the um, recordings. There are a number of them, and I encourage you to listen to a variety if you, if you want. On the IMC website, which is insightmeditationcenter.org, 
uh, Gill uh, reads this text actually. So there's, if you want this, this particular translation read, you can look there also. Thank you. And then uh, Steve. I don't know if this is necessary or not, <clears throat> but it occurred to me if, if, uh, if there are members, participants today, who aren't all that familiar with the diff with when you say attachment, because it, it's such a loaded word in English, we think, well, what does it mean I shouldn't be attached to my kids kind of thing between that, that, that it refers to clinging. It's not, it's not that we shouldn't enjoy, but the clinging piece, and we don't use that word so much. But if that's, if that's important, if you think that's important, maybe just mention. Oh, okay, it. yeah, of course, this is not about attachment theory in psychology. Um, in Buddhism, attachment is generally not healthy. It's a, it's a grasping or a clinging or a uh, unhealthy kind of um, gripping. We can feel how it has that contraction to it. Okay, good. Well, enjoy your week. Thank you so much for being here today. And um, I will look forward to seeing you same time next week. Enjoy the reading. Take care.